Elizabeth Rosenberg. So this is a really interesting episode. We all know what PR is, public relations, and how that's evolved over time and how brands and individuals need to tell stories and find innovative ways to do so and cut through the clutter and all that jazz. Elizabeth is a very special human being. She is a PR maven, but also uh, decided to unlock a supernatural um, ability very deliberately and help people understand the foundation of their stories, for their brands, for themselves, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you can check her out at The Good Advice Company. The one thing I wanted to share with you is that I am a fellow skeptic. I've had a lot of spiritual practices and so on and so forth. I grew up in Detroit, down in LA, where we record the show often. And the experiences that I had with Elizabeth were very powerful. So as you guys listen or watch this interview, kind of keep that in mind. A couple of examples. One is there was a dude on our crew who she gave an impromptu reading to um, after we were done recording. Got some footage of it behind the scenes, but I chose not to share it. But also uh, it was incredibly powerful that young man was able to speak to his uh, deceased relatives and really understand and release some um, some pressures. And I think when it comes to innovation, I'm going to tie it back to business. When it comes to like innovation and creativity and where we come from and the things that we hold on to that kind of become hindrances and blocks to that infinite potential, it can be really powerful and game changing to have an experience that allows you to release. And so I, I shortly after I was like, hey, such and such said, thank you, Elizabeth. I sent her a text message and she was like, hey, I have a slot open on Friday if you want to do it. And I was like, okay. And I will tell you guys, like, for 90 minutes, that woman blew my mind. I'll spare you the details, but uh, my dad died a couple of years ago, and I had a all-out, full-blown conversation with him. Um, and uh, there were no parlor tricks, no magic. It just is what it is. So uh, Elizabeth said the truth, and I love the fact that she's able to tie together this sort of wizardry and, you know, core solid business principles. So as you guys listen, keep that in mind. Um, I wish I had done my experience with her before we recorded this interview. It just gave it so much more context and flowers and everything else that goes into making this a really special moment. So first interview, uh, first interview we're publishing in 2024. And I hope you guys enjoy it. And we will be back always with more great content. Masters of Craft, Elizabeth Rosenberg. Take it away. Welcome everybody to another installment of Masters of Craft. And I've had a bunch of media outlets ask me, what should we be saying right now? Not only for the company, but for your own personal brand. And I wrote something today that said, I don't know. And I think that more PR people and more executives need to be comfortable with the term, I don't know. We are living in unprecedented times with the speed at which communication and information is being shared. I remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, I had said to my coach, I'm so overwhelmed. And she was like, I'm not gonna let you use that word anymore. I want you to say there's so much opportunity. And every time I was overwhelmed, I was like, there is opportunity everywhere. And I had to start thinking about it as like abundance versus is things that I felt like were just too much for me. That small change in how I was approaching any kind of issue has made a huge difference. And just like, I think also just how I show up. Woo! You'd think that we would know what you're doing. We're two professionals here. We should know what uh, we're doing. Uh, you're a professional. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> here. Um, welcome everybody to another installment of Masters of Craft. Hi, Elizabeth Rosenberg. How are you? I'm great. Uh, thank you for being here. You're my first guest at Will I Am's FYI dot AI uh, studio. And um, are you AI or are you real a real person? I'm a real person. Okay. Yes. Whew. Um, and so is this space. It's beautiful. It is a beautiful space. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, without saying what you do for a living, who are you? I am someone who is constantly in search of my joy, living my purpose, and trying to make an impact in the world. Constantly in search of joy. Where is it? I think that's a good <laughs> where, where is your joy? I mean, it, you know, I feel like I find it in little places every day. There was a book I read. We talked a lot about, you know, spiritual books um, and how they come back around uh, called The Book of Joy, uh, Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And they talk about the difference between happiness and joy mm. and how happiness 
is that feeling that is quite sustaining yeah and how joy is very fleeting or sorry back, vice versa right how joy is sustaining and happiness is fleeting and i try to find moments of joy every day yeah i start my mornings with a list of gratitude and joy like every day and it's just like it could be a meal or it could be like a deal Ooh, i just rhymed hey and in times <laughs> like this that's hard yeah. Sometimes to find moments of gratitude and moments of joy. It's, it's the habit of getting into the practice of searching for it. It's kind of to your point. Like, exactly. I, I love that. Um, how does that play into PR and personal branding? <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people right now have no idea what their purpose is. They have no idea what brings them joy and are trying to fulfill what society and what everybody else on social media thinks they should be doing. Right. During the pandemic, especially during the pandemic, I realized that everyone's bios were reading like resumes and actually had nothing to do with who you are as a person. And I kind of made it my mission to help people rediscover who they are mm -hmm. and articulate that in their kind of professional and personal journey. Just, I can't imagine, you know, leaving this earth and my obituary reading like a resume Right. And it does because everyone's on LinkedIn with a bio that's like, here are all the things that I've done. <laughs> and that's the most public place for anybody to find yeah. any information. So we all talk about what we do, but nobody actually talks about who you are. Well, it's it's like we have to focus on what's sellable and what we think people want to hear, which is which is an interesting balance. Right. Sometimes putting what you do and how you exist in the world mm -hmm. into like business speak so that people who may not think like that, which is a lot of, uh, a lot of individuals, um, can understand. I have the same problem. It's just like, I, what do I do? I, 18 things. But it's, 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 encountering me hopefully makes you feel or see or you know look at the world differently. I mean, the who you are yeah, right. is what people are drawn to. It's like that, that paragraph that's in the bottom of your bio. Like, what if we all just put it at the top? Yeah, yeah. Like, and you're like, oh, okay, I get a gist of who you are. Cause this is the other thing is nobody wants to work with an asshole right now. Tell that to my, my crew. No one. <laughs> um, and people talk about that all the time, but how do you actually talk about the things that you're passionate about, what you actually care about, who you are, and then how that actually works into what you do for a living. It feels like there's a, <clears throat> excuse me. It feels like there's an era of, or an essence of fearlessness that's required. Oh, to God, to lead with the bottom paragraph. Yeah. Right? Like, um, tell us about your relationship with fearlessness and how you've encountered it in, you know, the world of publicity. I mean, it's fearlessness, but also vulnerability. Um, I first, I think, combated part of my fear, uh, telling my own personal story about burnout. So when I was working at a big ad agency, I actually loved my job. I think that's another thing that people talk about with burnout is that you only burn out if you hate your job. Mm. I loved my job. I was doing really, really cool stuff. I was traveling the world and I was just working too hard. And I ended up with a migraine in the emergency room where I lost all my motor skills. Wow. It was quite a dramatic story. Um, driving down the 405 in Los Angeles with no motor skills, slurring my words thinking that I'm having a stroke. Like just being like, I'm, I got this. <laughs> like, I'll I'm just impressed the, that you were I'll driving the down the 405. Room. Oh my God. Um, so I ended up telling that story in 2021. And I think the world was burned out at that point. We were all unsure how to like re-enter society in a way that actually made any sense. But telling that story, I threw up twice that morning before it went live there was so much fear around my vulnerability about that of no one's going to want to work with me because they're going to think that I am weak. Mm. Um, everyone is going to, you know, no one's going to relate to my story. <clears throat> and it was the exact opposite. To this day, I still get emails about it. That's great. Yeah, because yeah. it's like, and, and I think there's something to be said for when you share your story, even if it impacts one person, it was worth sharing. Yeah. Like the ripple effect of that is beautiful. So I if more agree. leaders could be fearless by sharing, I think their own truths. And again, I think you have to be careful, right? I'm in PR, figure out a way for it to all ladder up. That's yeah. kind of what I do with people is I figure out how to connect the dots 
so you can tell your relatable story, so you can be vulnerable, but also still lead. Well, that, I mean, it leads to a great point, especially in the world of publicity or in the world of like, some of our stories are meant to yield some sort of result, mm -hmm. get the job, get the deal, sell more products, you know, whatever it might be. How do you weave in that personal element to then affect like a bottom line business if it's true PR? I mean, that's such a hard question because it's so nuanced for the person, mm -hmm. for the business. Do you have a public business? Do you have a private business? Do you have a creative business? Do you have a not creative business? I mean, there's lots of those too. Um, and as the world, I think, becomes more divisive and more complicated in how you actually message things, I think you also need to have discernment as to where you share information. Yeah. Is it something that you're sharing internally? Or is it something you're actually sharing externally? Um, how much of your story are you willing to share? And to you, what's the point of sharing it? So it, it again, it's quite nuanced on how we approach our, our stories and our vulnerability. Which is funny, because I feel like in some ways, I'm gonna push this mic a yeah. little closer to you. The, um, <clears throat> the, the value of PR or the process of PR, I think people either greatly oversimplify or overcomplicate. Oh God! Right yes. there, when they come to you, like they don't realize that there's that whole list of boxes to be checked or questions to be asked versus just like, oh, just tell a story, reach out to Fast Company, or like, this, like there's this, like tell me about navigating that that space. I mean, I actually wrote something this morning about you know we are in a time of war, in in globally, and I've had a bunch of media outlets ask me what should we be saying right now, not only for the company but for your own personal brand. And I wrote something today that said, I don't know. <laughs> and I think that more PR people and more executives need to be comfortable with the term, I don't know. We are living in unprecedented times with the speed at which communication and information is being shared. And there is very little respect for the ability to actually like pause, take a rest, respond to a situation versus reacting to mm -hmm. it and get educated about what you're talking about before you make a statement. There's this societal need to respond immediately, have a statement, um, take a stance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just need to say, I don't know what our stance is right now and be honest with your people about that. We're going to like actually make sure that we are educating ourselves before we say something. Right. But again, back to discernment, like where do you make, where do you make the statement? What does it look like? But the need for everybody to rush onto social media and have a stance immediately without actually taking any consideration into what the long-term effect that, what yeah. that might look like. Where does that come is from? It's crazy. Like, where does that sense of urgency even <clears throat> come from? I mean, I know, yes, like we move at the speed of culture yeah. and you need to be in the conversation. Like there's, but it could be like a scarcity mindset, right? Like, oh, if we don't do this, then we'll, our business will fail. If we don't say something, if we don't address it, like there's some per perception of consequence. Yes, but there's also a consequence of being canceled and or a consequence, <laughs> like yeah. the opposite consequence mm -hmm. that I don't think everybody takes into consideration. I really think it's driven by the algorithms. Um, but it's also driven by this attack mode mob mentality of you can't do right ever. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the kind of using I don't know as a tool might be something that more leaders need to lean into. Because yeah. let's be real, like, do we all, are we sure we all know what we're doing? Like, we're, it's like a hope and a prayer at this point <laughs> that the decisions that we make yep. are the right decisions. Yep. Yeah. Um, we talked about this, this yesterday a little bit on the phone. Um, I host a series on Fast Company called The Work in Progress. And part of the mission of that is to show that there is some wiggle room and leeway in positive intention and maybe not the best attempt, right? Sometimes we have okay. to reward the attempt and not necessarily like, oh, they got it wrong or mm -hmm. they didn't say the right word or this person, you know, threw the wrong trash in the wrong bin. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that's me. I, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of... Uh, if funny. that's the worst thing you're doing, then... <laughs> no, I, I actually go person. into mild panics when I'm standing in front of like garbage cans and there's like three or four if options. Like, I'm like, God, I don't I'm going to ruin one. the planet and everybody's going to see it. Um, so I don't throw things away at all. I just, okay. my car is filled with trash. <laughs> um, but yeah, like that, that middle ground of like the failed attempts or the need for resolve. Like what's your, what's your take on that? 
every apology. Now, if you, you can look back on this and then also look forward. Every apology starts with, that was not our intent. Right. Our intent was this. There's a huge difference between intent and execution. Always. The only thing that I can say is that as a world, we have got to have a little more grace and understanding for the humans around us and the mistakes that we make. It's like you're just no longer allowed to make a mistake. Yeah. And I think there, as a child, there was this beauty in failure. You were allowed to try things and make a mistake and be okay with making a mistake and the lessons that you learn from it. So maybe we need to make a mistake and then talk about the lessons that we learned from it and encourage others that it's okay. Mm -hmm. But we, I, I, I can't wrap my head around why we live in a time where everyone's an expert on everything and why all of our voices need to be heard all the time. I say that, and you're, we're two people with a microphone in our hands, so that's all. We're, but this is what people need to know. But do you know what I mean? I'm doing a service. <laughs> See, that's, that's the flip. I'm hoping that this is helpful. Because <laughs> um, to me, I think there is beauty in listening. Yeah. And we don't listen enough. And just quiet time. Like, I think just like shut the fuck up for a little while and see what comes to you, right? Let the, let the chips fall. Yeah. Um, we don't have to always be on all the time. Uh, and on March 2nd, 2020, <laughs> yeah. um, you made a big decision. I did. Um, what went into that decision and how's it gone since? I quit my job on March 2nd of 2020. And just for the people listening or watching, yeah. that job was? I was the global head of communications for a very large ad agency. Again, job I actually really liked. Mm -hmm. The thought process behind it was I had outgrown that job. There was no upward mobility for me at that company and I didn't want to do that job for the rest of my life. I look back now and realized I just didn't have much purpose. I was very good at it, but it wasn't fulfilling. Mm -hmm. There was no meaning, I wasn't making an impact, I was just very good at doing PR. Um, at the time I was like, ooh, this is, you know, this is gonna be great, I'm gonna travel, I'm gonna figure out what I wanna do next, this is gonna be fantastic. <laughs> then the world closes down, and which I still believe was really intentional for me hmm. at that time. And my life took like a totally different trajectory in a very, beautiful way in terms of my own prefer, like professional development and personal development. Mm -hmm. um, you also started a music label, Akashic Records. <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> no, so, Just the oldest thing in like, you know, <laughs> yeah. existence, you but a, yeah. A music label. Yeah. Um, no, like, so one of the things I love is like you decided to take all the things that you've done for corporations and businesses and yeah. do that for individuals and like help them develop their personal brands and stories and things like that. but. You added this element yeah. of spirituality to it, which, you know, there's also a bit of coming out. Like I read some of your posts where you're like, I'm, I'm coming out as mm -hmm. a spiritual, you know, uh, person. Yeah. Um, tell us about that intersection of craft yeah. as well as like what it was like to start to really celebrate that yeah. publicly. I mean, to unpack that a little bit, like after I had burned out, I went on this mission to do everything I possibly could to figure out how to not have that happen again. I think there's this misnomer again with, with burnout is like that you can prevent it. And I actually don't believe that's possible because mm -hmm. your burnout is gonna look different than someone else's. Yeah. So you can prevent it maybe next time, but your burnout itself is unique to you. So when I went on this journey, I was like, I will do anything. I will, if I, if I, I mean literally. <laughs> If I had to walk Shout around out to Milo, by the way. only where I know, maybe we can talk to him. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. hey. hey, hey, um, <laughs> <Seance. Just handle laughs> um, if I had to like wear orange and walk around backwards and speak gibberish and they were like, you'll never have a migraine again. I'd be like, this is me now. <laughs> this is, I am now owning this. So very long series of events. I was introduced to the Akashic records. Uh, which is a kind of a library of your soul's journey, past, present, future. It is a database of information is the best way to describe it. Now, when the world closed down, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna start consulting in PR. This is gonna be great. And I did do that right. for a year. 
Then people came to me and started asking, would you be able to help me with, with, your, with my brand? I was like, I don't know. I mean, I know how to do PR. I've done this for other leaders. I guess I can figure this out. I didn't ever think of it as like an offering and as something that I would actually do as a business. And at the same time, as the world is closed down, I'm practicing my Akashic records. And I, when I had left this company, I was in touch with CMOs of major companies and executives at major companies who are also all home feeling very purposeless and mm. rudderless and looking for answers elsewhere. So in 2020, I became like the marketing world's like dirty little secret of <laughs> spirituality and ended up doing like over a hundred readings for wow. C-suite leaders, for startup founders, for, I wasn't charging, people were exchanging things. With, like I was like, we need some kind of energetic exchange. And finally like, my house was full of so much shit that I'm like, I can't, we have to figure out a different way to do this. In that process? Or what's one memorable one? I got a lot of books, which I think during the pandemic, I actually like really, really loved. Okay. Right. Um, but there was one, Oh, you know, one client sent me like a full like charcuterie board package. <laughs> and I was like, oh, like I haven't, we, <laughs> this is kind of nice. I mean, it was the most random stuff, right? Cheese and books. All right. I see. It was so weird. Um, but again, that exchange of energy. So as I started to think about what this branding process looked like, I was working with leader and in, I kept these worlds very, very separate on purpose. And in the middle of her session, her guides came through and I was trying to have two conversations at the same time. And I'm like, oh, oh Lord, I don't know what is going on right now. And I'm like, I am so sorry. <laughs> Heads up, not sure if you know that I do this, but I also read the Akashic Records on the side and I'm getting like really intense messages for you. And I, that never happens mm. just on the fly. And she was like, oh my God, tell me everything. Like, what do you, that's rad. Like she was like, oh, I read my Oracle cards. I'm like, oh. Okay, cool. There's another person who, who I can discuss this with. And then I realized if I can add an Akashic reading at the beginning of a session or beginning of a workshop with someone, it immediately instills trust. Mm. I can see where all of their blocks might be around purpose, around abundance, around trauma. And I can literally ask the guides like, or the Akashic records, like, what is this person's purpose and why are they meant to be here? And if I can do all of that in an hour, it is like supercharging who you actually are, not who you're telling me you are. Yeah. So everything's stripped back. I would imagine this is like, uh, the, the, there, there can be a lot of tearful moments. There can be oh, a lot of like, yeah. aha, like big ahas, not like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. It's like, oh, I didn't know that was a th like, what are some of the discoveries and maybe give us some examples yeah. of like, oh, here's the types of things people discover and how it gets applied to their craft on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, I think by adding in my expertise in PR is what allows me to harness the records in a really unique way because I'm not only, I'm really getting to like the core and the origin of your story. Um, and kind of like uncovering the soul of your brand. It's like I'm bringing purpose to people in a, in a really lovely way. Um, yes, I've had a lot of people cry. <laughs> um, but honestly, like I kind of cry sometimes too. I mean, I have, I've had people's loved ones come through. I've had um, a lot of parents that have passed who have a lot of wisdom and things that they just want to say. When I'm in the records of somebody, they tend to talk a lot in metaphors. Mm. So we can talk about like a garden and it's like, oh my God. And for that person, it was something that's super related to them because it was a seed that they needed to plant and how they needed to move forward. Um, I also think when they tell me purpose, it's very broad. And they break it into soul purpose and life purpose. Mm -hmm. And the way that I like to talk about that is if a soul purpose is like a thesis statement, your life purpose is like a supporting, a, a supporting act, right? right? And how you're actually actualizing that soul purpose in this lifetime. It can be everything from teaching to becoming one with love to, um, I think like, there's a lot about mentorship. 
they're very broad. Mm -hmm. But I think when people hear them, something clicks that then makes them feel like, oh, I've been doing this. I just haven't been thinking about the fact that I've been doing it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, it makes me also think sometimes the information you might get and whether it's through a spiritual practice like that or just intuition or whatever it may be that's telling you you should be doing something else other than what you've been doing for the last 10, 15, 20 years. That can be really scary to like, how do I start over? Um, and or re revisit my purpose in and present this way. And maybe you went through that and as part of your process yeah. of like, oh, uh, I now need to tell people that this is a thing. Some people might think it's weird, <laughs> um, but it also is a part of, I need to own it and be vulnerable. Yeah. Like, maybe that like that mm, inflection point of like transition from what used to be and what now should be. It's like, a, it's a scary transition, I, I would imagine. It is, and I think <laughs> when I when I did my coming out story, when I posted that, I thought I was going to feel the same way that I did about my burnout story. So you threw up a bunch of times. I, I didn't. <laughs> that was it. Was so weird. <laughs> didn't cry. I didn't feel sick. I didn't feel anything. It was mm. just kind of like, well, here it is. Let's see where it lands. Now, as a PR person, I had like backup plans, right? I'm like, if this goes very badly. I'm going to pack up my stuff. I'm going to go to Bali for a year. We're going to see what happens. Then I'm just going to like come back a total like healer. And this is going to be amazing. Um, that is t definitely not what happens. <laughs> um, no one was surprised. That was the thing that kind of blew my mind. Everyone's like, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Which didn't make sense to me. So I think it was a real mirror for me in that sense of like, oh, you guys all saw this and like no one told me. Mm. And I think that's what happens when a lot of people uncover their purpose. And again, my job is to just be like, hey, here's your purpose. But now let's figure out how to tie that into work, how to tie that into what you do, how to make it livable, how to actually make it. it it's 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 oddly coaching, but it's also spiritual guidance, mm -hmm. but it's also comms. Right. It's like taking all of the things that I've done in my life and then putting them together in a way that actually like makes me feel like I really love my job. Like I say to people all the time, like I actually can't believe I get to do this for a living. I get to do something that I really like my side hustle that I was very passionate about. Right. And then my expertise that I'm really good at and marry those two things together in a great way. And that's kind of what I hope my clients get out of it yeah. too. There's also like a meta thing around this cause <laughs> it, because I think you like you also have to like then market yourself in PR. You have to do for it's so yourself weird. what you do for others. Yeah. Like, do you, like how does that work? And are you good at it for yourself? <laughs> and where would you like to be better? I mean, PR people are like we're like the cobbler's kid with no shoes. <laughs> Always. Um, it's very weird for me to talk about things. Um, and I don't actively think about promoting myself. I actively think about being true to who I am authentically. Yeah. Now I do think I like our industry has kind of ruined the word authentic, the word brand, the word purpose, personal brand. I mean, those terms have all become so like marketing jargon. Now yeah. it's actually hard to kind of wrap my head around what the future of those look like and how, how we can make them actually have meaning again. Um, we'll have to ask the FYI AI bot. Maybe they'll, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Maybe the yeah. AI bot will know. Um, the Akashic intelligence. <laughs> huh? Huh? I, it's, I just pitched something. I don't We're doing it. go into <laughs> the Akashic records enough for myself, hmm. which I thought about the other day. It's like, have you ever been in the, like I go into my records occasionally, but I don't go in enough. So I should, if I'll ask that and then find out for you and let you know. You're welcome. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, similarly, those like massage therapists don't ever get a massage. Exactly. Right? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, so sorry, continue. Um, it is very, very hard to authentically be true to who you are for a few reasons. I think there's fear of acceptance of that person and then actually having to be that person. Yeah. So your timeline's your timeline. Sometimes I work with clients and they're like, I am ready to like talk about my story now mm -hmm. and how that story then weaves into their everyday lives. Other people are like, I know my story. I'm not ready to share it. 
I wasn't ready to share the spiritual aspect of me for two years, three years. And then somebody said to me, how can you keep telling your clients to be authentically themselves if you're not authentically you? And I was like, oh. It's like a social media expert that doesn't <laughs> have any followers. Right. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. It was like, oh, that's frustrating. Um, I have a quote from you. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Oftentimes we don't think our stories are relevant, important, or even all that interesting or relatable. I'm happy to help you unearth your story and embolden you to embrace it. You don't know what a difference in your life and in others it will make once it's out of you and into the world. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that there's a common pivot point in life that people like, I think I'm ready. Like, is it, is it divorce? Is it, you know, like, oh, a burnout? Is what, yeah. Like, what is the, the personal flexion point that this statement becomes relevant for? That's such a good question. And the other, I the, think it's, the last bit I wrote on yeah. here too, I said some people are <laughs> come too soon and maybe don't yet have their story formulated because they don't, haven't done that back end work and really understanding what, what it might be. I mean, the reality is I think the story that you think is interesting isn't at all. And the story that you don't think is interesting is the one that will actually always make the impact. Mm. Sometimes you need someone else to help you unearth what that is and help you figure out why that story is actually important. Um, I get so much joy out of that. That is like, I mean, it kind of like makes me emotional because like I kind of can't believe I get to do that yeah. and get to help people see what that is. And then articulate it in a way that doesn't feel weak, that doesn't feel inauthentic, like, like right? You're testing it too. Yeah, right. Like, I'm gonna just put out a little bit and see. Like, either you go a hundred or like it's zero. So, it's so dependent on the person. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is I, th thanks to social media, but I think that we think that when we tell our story everyone is gonna be like, this is amazing, you shared it, it's changed my life for all these reasons. Maybe just one person saw it, and maybe that's, maybe that's enough. Right. Maybe that person will then share their story, and millions of people will see it, and that was because you shared yours. We have to think about the long-term impact of what that looks like, versus that initial rush of likes well i mean it's like we started out the conversation like social currency is everything so yeah oh if i only have nine likes then maybe i'm not worthy or this isn't the mm -hmm. right story like do you start to second guess what it is and maybe that person that you affected you don't even know they could have been a lurker right like it just could have like read the post not said anything went and took that information and told their spouse and then that person did something and you didn't you you have yeah. no tangible evidence that your story was impacted. I mean, I tell people that all the time though. I post on LinkedIn and I will get so many DMs and so many texts about the things that I write and none of those people are liking the posts. Right. There is even this fear about if I like this, someone's gonna see that I like that and then what does that mean for me? Mm -hmm. Like we are living in this constant, I think, again, like fear of what yeah. that looks like. There's also uh, skepticism comes to mind. <laughs> when, when yes, you start talking I mean, about, I am talking about, about magical so, powers. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and just in public relations in general, it's like, who, I, I don't know if this is the real story, if yeah. it's not the story, you know, and then yeah. this one is counterintuitive to that one, and maybe I, this one didn't have enough likes, so I, do I even believe that? Like, skepticism, <laughs> I think, runs rampant in today's culture. Yeah because there are so many information sources, there's also other things just vying for our attention. So, I mean, I can't remember the last time I read an article that said more than a three minute read, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, so, I, I mean, tell me about like overcoming or circumnavigating, ooh, that's a good word. Circumnavigating, everybody write that word down. <laughs> um, circumnavigating uh, skepticism. This is the thing that's wild, and this is actually what I love about the Akashic Records. In every reading, I will inevitably say something that someone goes, there is no way that you would have known that. So skepticism just goes away. Right. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, what a great tool that is. You can't is. hit that, that three-pointer, like, yes I can. You're like, <laughs> um, I mean, let's be real too. We all have free will. I am not one of those people that says, go to an intuitive to make major life choices. Mm -hmm. That is a bad idea. <laughs> um, go to an intuitive, to kind of come to grips with or uncover things that you need clarity on, go to an intuitive for entertainment value. Yeah. Uh, this 
industry, the spiritual industry is a minefield because I think there are some people who are very, very good at what they do. And there are some people who like every industry, right? Um, prey on people who are in a place of um, uncertainty, uncertainty and sadness. Um, I think that's also why I kind of tie mine in with, again, with work to make it feel very purpose driven. I'm not going to tell you to invest in anything. I'm not going to medically tell you what's going wrong, going on with you. It's oh, very I guess I should cancel my level. appointment then. <laughs> it's very high level We're trying stuff. to get these chips up. I think the other thing about spirituality too is that there's all these books out there and there's all these classes out there and these all these TikTok mediums who are telling us this is the way that you have to do things. Right. I find that to be absolutely ridiculous. We will not know who is right or wrong until we die. We won't. You're not like... <laughs> Like when they talk about enlightenment, like someone who was here made that up. Um, God, someone who was here made that up. Mm -hmm. However you choose to look at spirituality is right. It is your choice. Um, and I think that we need to be much more open with different forms of spirituality, what it looks like and accepting that, okay, that's how that person does that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good for you. <laughs> Um, it reminds me of a quote that I love, which is nothing has meaning except the meaning we give it. You know, I love that. If, exactly. If it's that piece of jewelry, you know, mm -hmm. or ask any athlete of what rituals they do before they go out on the field or go to the game. It's just like, I guess it works for you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what have you learned about belief? And I'm going to level that up a little bit. And neuroscience. Right. I think there's, you yeah. know, when this art of persuasion and getting people to make decisions, right, there's there's belief and then there's just like the biochemical science of what happens when in our brains and our bodies when we have to make a decision, a change, a pivot, a purchase. I mean, they go hand in hand quite, quite beautifully if you choose for them to. There's a book that I have a lot of my clients read, which I'm not gonna, it is to me even like very out there. Um, called The Vortex. But the principles to me are very smart. It's the power of the law of attraction. An example would be when you, let's say you're dating somebody and they don't text you back and you're like, oh, clearly this person was in like a car accident and they, um, you know, they're, they're no longer they available. They burnt out on the 405. Right? Versus this person missed the text. They just don't want to talk to you. Like there's a lot of other things that are going on right now. Um, that idea of when something, you put a negative thought in your mind, immediately replacing it with three positive ones. You are retraining your brain to think about it in a positive way. I also think there's a lot of my clients who say like, I don't want this in my life. You are also throwing out that energy of inviting in all of that stuff that you don't want. Yeah. So we do have to think about that idea of retraining. I remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, I had said to my, um, coach I'm so overwhelmed and she was like I'm not gonna let you use that word anymore I want you to say there's so much opportunity hmm. and every time I was overwhelmed I was like I am there's opportunity everywhere yeah. and I had to start thinking about it as like abundance versus things that I felt like were just too much for me that small change in how I was approaching um, any kind of issue and how I do and, and how I approach it now has made a huge difference. And just like, I think also just how I show up. Yeah. So, but that power of retraining your brain, I don't think we think about enough and not thinking about it as manifestation. Cause I also think there is this social media craze that it's like, I'm going to make a vision board and I'm going to say all these things. <laughs> yep. I'm not going to work. I'm just going to like, manifest and then millions of dollars and all the things are going to just show up on your lap. Like yes. that is not how that works. So we have, a, we've given people like a false sense of hope. Yeah. I think, you know, in this era of technology, um, artificial intelligence being a really hot topic currently, but then, you know, every other medium of uh, means of connecting and, and things like that can interrupt your connection to spirit. Mm -hmm. um, do you find like, where have you found really good intersectionality of like technology and the work that you do? And it could be none, like I just. I was gonna, I actually had to think about that for a second. Yeah. There's none, zero. 
N- none. Um, I'm trying to think of any technology that I use when I so I do all my readings via mm-hmm. Zoom. I have found that I prefer it that way. You're in your safe space. I'm in mine. Now, when people have real strong energy or real strong guides, the Zoom will go crazy. Really? It will crackle. Sometimes it turns off. Sometimes there's been flashing lights. Sometimes the emojis. Like I had one that was like the ups and down thumbs. It was turned off on everything. (laughs) And it just kept, it was, even me was like, is everyone else seeing this right now? Like this is crazy. Um, It was wild. When I am in my own meditative state, I handwrite everything, everything. So I I really, I mean, because even when I'm doing that, I'll sometimes I'll listen to like the ocean or something just as white noise to Mm -hmm. block out what's going on. It'll get all crackly. It'll get all weird. It'll turn on and off. And I'm like, this was just kind of a moot point. Escaping the matrix. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) When you sat down and you were testing the mic, and uh, you did it go crazy? <laughs> no, I, maybe I don't know. I have to ask these guys. See if anybody dies after after <laughs> we shoot this. Um, sorry, guys. No, no that is not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, it won't. I mean, we will all die after this at some point. So, so that's actually funny. One of the questions that I get all the time is, when I, will I die? I, yes, I really? just don't know. I, I would not, not want to know when. I just don't want you to tell me I'm gonna die. And I'm like, newsflash. Right. <laughs> we are here not that long. Like, we will all die. It's okay. And it's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to live forever. Um, so when you sat down, you said, yeah. I'm a publicist. I've been a publicist for this. Like, yeah. you still identify as that. Like, where does that craft still show up in your life? And like, how does, you know, are you still have one foot in that, in the pure publicity pool? Like, in how does that identity play a part in you? The thing that I think I still love about PR are the tools that I've learned from it. Communication, writing, um, leadership, I use all of those tools on a regular basis. And again, I think that's where my expertise lies in that like really deep story mining. It, it actually makes a reading with me and like that branding process with me much more fun because in my head, I'm putting together the entire story of what your brand looks like. I'm putting together how you line everything up with your purpose. I'm putting together what that then looks like how do we media optimize you, right? Like, or if you want to be media optimized, Mm -hmm. but what thought leadership pieces are you going to talk about? What should you stay away from? What should you, what should you actually be focusing on? So I actually do feel like I'm, I show up as a PR person, um, in my everyday life. I think spirituality is my differentiator. It's what I can add into the mix. That's just different than, than what other people offer. I also think that it allows me to not be that that spiritual person that corporate people can't relate to. Yeah, I've been in corporate America for twenty five years. I like, thought you were going to bring I your, your uh, white turban with you today. My, uh, no, <laughs> I was like, "Where's the turban?" Um, continue. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, and I and I honestly feel like corporate America needs spirituality more than anyone else yeah like part of i really believe part of my purpose is to like help overcome that bias and again because it looks different to everyone what does that look like for you yeah and how do i how do i as a leader help you know that it's okay to explore your spirituality in whatever ways and means that might look like for for some it could be religion Mm-hmm. For some, it could be the Akashic Records. For some, it could be, I, I mean, you know, dancing it out. I mean, it could be anything. I mean, I just, I also just think in the time that we're living in, the terms that we are continuing to take from the past are so antiquated and don't make any sense anymore. Like meditation. <laughs> is, we no longer sit in Om. That is not what meditation really looks like for most people. Right. For me, it's like stress walking, singing at the top of my lungs through the streets of Santa Monica. Yeah, I think there's a difference between meditating and being meditative, right? Like, a thousand percent, yeah. yeah. And most people, by the way, don't have the attention span to actually meditate. So what does your meditative process look like? Yeah. 
Well, I, I mean, I've been theorizing a lot around, you know, there was a quote, another quote that I love, which is any problem at any company is a human problem. And so, yeah, and true. every day you're trying to solve problems, you know. Until AI to, takes over, but yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it'd still be a human problem. Still a human right? problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think when you do want to make a grand shift in your business or pivot or fix the, you know, the thing, um, there is a depth that we are not aware that we need to go to yeah. to do that. Because, yes, you can do the workshops and have the expert come in and talk about X, Y, and Z, and then people do the behavior for two weeks. But they haven't changed as humans. They've changed their, like, re- their relationship to their task, but not their relationship to themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're working with individual clients, like a CMO, for instance, mm-hmm. or CEO, uh, what do you see as a trickle down in affecting like actual change inside of an organization? I think the number one change that I've seen within my clients is how they show up. When you're showing up more yourself and you're a little more vulnerable and authentic with your people, they then have the permission yeah. to be a little more authentic themselves. I also think when people find me, and I feel like everyone finds me when they're supposed to, but when they find me, they're on their own personal and professional development journey, whatever that might look like. And I think it just accelerated again during the last few years because everyone's like, what am I meant to be here? What am I doing? Like, what is the greater yeah. thing that I'm supposed to be you know, leaving this earth with? That then leads to a few more boundaries, hopefully, and a little self-care. And when people in leadership are doing that, they're setting the example and they're allowing for space and time for their team to be doing that. Mm -hmm. So like at a company that I was at, my entire team was in therapy. We just all agreed on making sure that the timing block was right and that some were going in the morning, some were going in the afternoon, but pretty much everybody was in therapy one day a week. Wow. And my team showed up in a much I think stronger form because they had an outlet to deal with the things that they were dealing with versus bringing all of that to work until they burnt up. No, I'm kidding. uh, (laughs) um, Oh, it all uh, happens. Right. But then the other therapist to discuss it with. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I think that's great. I think it's great to see um, like the group effort, you know, and, and how it affects productivity and those sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, when you think about the skill sets of learning curves and like going out on your own and being your own CEO and not answering to the boss now, like what is a skill or two that you might still be trying to master? Not doing everything. Hmm. I think the best advice that any like entrepreneur will probably give another entrepreneur is like know what you don't know and then like hire people to do those things. I'm watching my career evolve so quickly that I'm still trying to figure out what are those things that I can delegate to other people. Yeah. And I think that's just what my career is probably going to continue to look like for yeah. a while. But if you had told me three years ago that I would be working with executives, reading their Akashic records and like helping uncover the soul of their brand to show up as a great leader, I would have told you you were insane. <laughs> I would have thought that I would have been doing PR for a big brand. That was where that was the trajectory that my career was on. Now, I love what I do, but entrepreneurialism is hard, especially when, again, we live in this time of, I think, somebody used this phrase the other day and I loved it, um, empathic distress. Mm. Where, Say more. Where it's where you energetically are feeling the stress of the world. And I feel that deeply because I think that there are more people who are in tune empathically with what we feel right. around us, right? The other thing too is like everyone is awakening and like on different times timelines. Mm-hmm. I always feel like there's a point in someone's life, whether it be divorce, death, birth, sickness, pandemic, something like that, that catapults them into their personal journey, whatever that might look like, dealing with trauma, dealing with um, all the things that they haven't dealt with otherwise in their, in their life. 
I also feel like that's the time when people start to uncover spiritual abilities, um, have much more empathy, but also just kind of like awareness of what's going on around us. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating to me is, you know, there's an entire generation of kids that like never turn that off. How, how did those, how are those generations going to, going to really vibe together when you have people who are now again, reawakening maybe what society told us to turn off as kids due to some kind of traumatic experience. And then you've got all these kids who are like charging their crystals on the full moon, know what their astro- you know astrological signs are, and are talking to their loved ones and doing like Reiki on people and don't even know they're doing it. Right. I mean, it's like really, really wild to see <laughs> the evolution. And then you've got parents who are like fully accepting of that. They're no longer talking to their imaginary friends. They're they're like having <laughs> a spiritual experience. And you're like, what is that going to look like when that? all merges together yeah that's uh, these are the kinds of things that i think about at night right like, yeah, um, well, yeah i want a seat inside your brain like wait what are you talking about um speaking of kids i, yeah. I feel like a lot of um people who are spiritual gifted or spiritually gifted forward mm-hmm. um there's it's almost like a cycle like you was there anything in your childhood where you kind of saw this and you're like oh that's weird and then as an adult you're like oh now you here you are on masters of craft yes (laughs) you made it (laughs) um yes i mean it's it's funny my dad's a sci-fi writer i did a book report on if mediums are real when I was 10. Um, I don't know why, I just did. (laughs) Saw my first first medium when I was 10 years old. I said said yes, they were real. That's a great documentary too, by the way. (laughs) Um, I do think that there are, especially if you're spiritually inclined as you get older, there are abilities that you have as a child that you just kind of ignore. Now, my family was not one to be like, turn that off. I think society was. So it slowly turned back on as I got older. And then it was just like a fire, like somebody turned on a fire hose. It just kind of like came to the point where during the pandemic, I actually went and got a CAT scan. Cause I'm like, I wanna make sure I don't have (laughs) something like a brain tumor or something. Cause I'm hearing a lot. Even my neurologist was like, why did you get a CAT scan? And I'm like, this is what's going on. She was like, oh, hmm, okay. (laughs) I also don't ever call it a gift. I'm very, very adamant that it is an ability Hmm. that we all have. And we all have the ability to turn on and turn off when, when we need to. I don't think this younger generation is really ever turning it off, which I think is rad. So I'm excited to see where that goes. But... I would not call it a gift because I got to tell you there's some times that I'm like, I don't know if I would have asked for this. I think as you become more comfortable with your ability, you're running higher energy. It's harder on your body. Um, There's the societal, I think, stress of Mm -hmm. like, what are people going to think about this? So I don't know if I, I definitely wouldn't call it a gift. And I, I think back on it a lot of like, would I still want this? Mm-hmm. I think I'm meant to be experiencing it right now. But I, that is a question that I ask myself a lot of would I choose this if I had the choice to. Um, I'm glad you chose it. <laughs> I can't wait to read you. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Let's do it now. Let's do it on the camera. <laughs> oh, no. Um, no, thank you so much for, I mean, yes, I'm accepting the offer. I'm not going to do it right now. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, where can people find more? How can we support? What's, um, you know, what, yeah. do you, what do you want people to know? Um, I, thegoodadvicecompany.com is the best place to reach me. And LinkedIn. I have a lot of a lot of thoughts that I share on LinkedIn. I find that to be my favorite social media tool. That is where I feel like I'm actually making the most impact and reach because I want more leaders who are standing in front of the workforce of today to be more accepting of different forms of healing, different forms of thinking, um, and like honestly just different ways of living. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yay. One one person applause. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Cute applause applause like